Hi everyone, welcome. My name is Alex Cassano. I'm the events coordinator here at the Clearwater Historical Society. Today I want to welcome you to the Tampa Bay Downs presentation with Mike Henry. I want to tell you before uh, we get started about a few events we're having at the museum. So next Saturday, October 30th from 10 to 2, we'll be having our first annual Tampa Bay Area Museum Expo. The Tampa Bay Area Museum Expo is featuring different Pinellas County museums. You can meet the museum representatives and um, talk with them. And also, we're having a trivia competition for the museum representatives. Also coming up on November 6th, the Saturday after October 30th, um, is our Family Fun Day. Um, that's a celebration of Clearwater Historical Society. It's uh, as well as our annual general meeting. We'll have food, games, an author fair, and book signing, um, as well as other things to do. So please uh, come and check out these events and more um, at the Colorado Historical Society. So I want to welcome Mike Henry. Thank you, Mike. Thank you, Alex. <laughs> well, I want to thank you all for attending and uh, letting me spread the gospel of Tampa Bay Downs. Uh, everything falling apart here already. Um, our season opens on Wednesday, November 24th, which is the day before Thanksgiving, and we run all the way through Kentucky Derby Day uh, next May. It's a 90-day racing season, and it's actually our 96th anniversary season. Oh, wow. uh, the track originally opened in 1926, and uh, according to some of the published reports, on our opening day card that year, some of the uh, celebrities that attended included Babe Ruth and um, Gene Sarazen, the great golfer, and John Ringling, the circus impresario. And uh, the track has come a long way since then, obviously. It, it was not the easiest place in the world to get to. and. Uh, there were times when, uh, even as late as the 80s, uh, access was a lot more difficult than it is today. I remember driving to the track one Saturday from Hillsborough County in about 1986 or 1987. And at that time, there was only one lane driving west on Hillsborough Avenue, and the traffic had come to a standstill. And I was covering the track at the time for the Tampa Tribune, and I really needed to get there in time for the stakes race, which I knew would start about 4.30. And it was 4 o'clock, and the traffic's going nowhere. So I said, well, I got two choices. I can either miss the stakes race or do something. And I said, I think I'm going to drive on the shoulder. This was for about three miles and take my chances. Just waiting for that uh, police siren the sound in back of me. And I made it, and I covered the race, but one person who didn't make it was the jockey on the favorite horse in that race. He had gotten caught in the traffic. His trainer had to switch jockeys. The horse finished way back, and it, it was really quite funny at the time. The only guy who wasn't laughing was the trainer of the favorite. <laughs> so, uh, so much has changed since then, but if you look at the history of Tampa Bay Downs and going back to the late 40s after World War II, which in one sense was kind of a turning point for the track just because everything was exploding in America and people were getting back to entertainment and having a good time and going places and people were working full employment and just uh, getting ready to go into the 50s, which for a lot of people was a great decade. And there were several famous sports writers who used to come down during spring training, and they would hang out at Tampa Bay Downs. Uh, among them, uh, names you may have heard of, such as Red Smith with the New York Times, uh, Grantland Rice, who uh, was from Nashville and wrote Sports Forever, and Fred Russell and Arthur Daly. And Red Smith, after one of his first visits to the track, uh, kind of described it this way. He wrote, America's newest palace of pleasure and temple of chance is a rude clearing in the palmetto thickets that is aptly called Sunshine Park. 
because the sun has steadfastly refused to shine upon it, and the nearest park of consequence is Yellowstone. <laughs> so, Chris Smith, I guess, uh, probably wasn't here more than two or three days if the sun didn't shine. He, he really had a dark spot. But I think he was just trying to be funny, and uh, those guys loved it because it was just this escape, almost back into another time. You know, the uh, racetracks in South Florida uh, were making a little quicker progress, uh, especially in terms of purse money and the quality of racing and so on. And Tampa Bay Downs was trying to establish a foothold uh, in the community. And as I mentioned, one of the things that uh, blocked that at times was the access to getting to the track. And there were a few milestones that started to turn that around. Um, first of all, uh, in 1968, I believe it was, 1968, the entire grandstand burned. So the owners who, at the time, uh, the majority owner was a man named Chester Ferguson, he decided to invest uh, $800,000, which probably is the equivalent to now of four or five million, I guess, to rebuild the grandstand with a capacity for 6,000 people. And this showed that his ownership group was serious about making horse racing work in Oldsmar and in Tampa Bay Downs. Uh, he knew that the Tampa Bay market had tremendous potential and uh, that it was likely to continue to grow in population and popularity over the years. And that was a big step. And then throughout the 70s, uh, things kind of stayed on an even keel. But $300,000 is a lot of money, right? I mean, we'd all like to be able to call upon that whenever we could. And back then, if the track handled 300000 a day, and what that means is if it took in $300,000 of wagering on a single day of races, that was a great day. Do you realize now that Tampa Bay Downs averages uh, in the vicinity of $5 million a day wagering on its races? It is, during the winter, it is the fourth most popular signal in North America for wagering because, you know, people all over the country can bet on any track they want. Uh, we trail only New York, Santa Anita, and, um, and Gulfstream Park during that time of year. We are actually ahead of Fairgrounds and New Orleans and Oaklawn Park in Arkansas. These are big name tracks. So uh, it just shows you how much the track has improved and the quality of racing has picked up. And you say, well, what kind of drove that? I think one of the things that drove it was in 1980, a name I think most of us remember, the owned the Yankees, George Steinbrenner. And George Steinbrenner became an ownership partner in Tampa Bay Downs. I heard a story once that on opening day of Steinbrenner's first year, there was a big crowd there. A lot of people were there because they wanted to see George Steinbrenner. You know, he owned the Yankees, they had won two World Series and so on. And the track had not printed enough, enough programs for the number of people that came through the doors. So people had no way of knowing what horses they wanted to bet on. You gotta have a program to play the horses. Steinbrenner, the story goes, blew his top. He, he promised that heads were gonna roll for this. And what he did, after he calmed down a little, was he told the program department, look, I don't care how you do it, go to the printer, but we gotta print the programs right now, and we gotta get them on you know, just on paper, we don't need to bind them, whatever we need to do, but we need to get this information to the public. And they did it in time for the first race. You know, when Steinbrenner said jump, it's how high, and uh, he was the owner of the track uh, into the mid-80s. Uh, and of course, he owned the track, as I mentioned, the Ferguson family in partnership with the Fergusons. And uh, by that point in time, Chester Ferguson's daughter, Stella Ferguson Thayer, Stella Thayer had uh, taken over part of the management and they decided in 1986 that they wanted to uh, go in different directions. 
So they had an auction to determine who would be the sole owner of Tampa Bay Downs. Well, everybody and their brother knew, or thought they knew, that George Steinbrenner was going to outbid Stella Thayer for the track because the general consensus was he could go as high as he wanted to go and she would eventually have to say no more. There were two or three other people who were also in the bidding. And um, anyway, it got to about 16 million. And George Steinbrenner said, I'm out. And all of a sudden, Stella Thayer was the sole owner of Tampa Bay Downs. And has been for the last, what is it, 35 years. Uh, she owns the track in partnership with her brother, Hal Ferguson. And when Stella Thayer was hired, some very significant changes started to be made that has helped Tampa Bay Downs to get to its position uh, now. And one of the first ones was that she hired Lorraine King as general manager. And this marked the first time in history, this was a real groundbreaking hire, because it was the first time in history that any racetrack in North America had had a female owner and a female general manager. So let's hear it for the gals. Okay. Girl power. So, yeah, so, so that was a huge deal. And then, uh, right at the beginning of the season in 1986, Stella Thayer, who's a very prominent attorney, had managed to get the clearance to introduce Sunday racing to Tampa Bay Downs. Now that doesn't sound like a big deal now, but Tampa Bay Downs and a lot of racetracks had never raced on Sunday. And the first Sunday that they ran, Tampa Bay Downs attracted, I think it was close to 6,000 people, which quite a large uh, crowd, trust me. And um, it was a lot of families, a lot of kids. Uh, of course, the kids weren't allowed to bet, and still aren't. But, you know, it was, it was a family environment. And um, that kind of paved the way for the introduction of the backyard picnic area, which if you've ever been to Tampa Bay Downs, is a great family gathering spot uh, just on the other side of the paddock. And um, it's, people can hang out there any day, but on Sundays there are games and rides for kids, and we bring out our mascot, uh, who is a miniature horse named Mouse, mm -hmm. and all the kids get to interact with Mouse, and it's just a lot of fun. And to be honest with you, the people in the backyard picnic area might watch one or two races during the day. But they're just out there to have a good time in a, in a friendly atmosphere and a relaxed atmosphere. And if they expose the kids to horses for the first time, that's a plus for Tampa Bay Downs because there is just something magical about thoroughbred racehorses. If you've ever been up close to one and, and you look in its eye, it's, it's a mysterious kind of thing where you wonder about all the uh, history, I guess, that, that has gone into producing this animal that is capable of competing at speeds of up to 40 miles an hour. Mm -hmm. And also, for a lot of those horses, when that eye looks another horse in the eye coming down the stretch, makes it give a little more effort to try to win a race. You know, they're very uh, competitive animals. I suppose not all of them are. Uh, but uh, it's just something to watch and to marvel at. Horse racing is a sport in North America. It goes all the way back to colonial times. You know, you had landowners in the 1700s that would uh, put their best horse against uh, other landowners' horses and uh, wager on the races. Of course, it was different then. Uh, a lot of times the races were three, four miles in length. Uh, horses perhaps had more endurance then, and they actually sometimes would race in heats, where it was the best two out of three heats and so on. So horse racing's been around for a long time, and of course it goes back even uh, uh, further than that, uh, overseas and what have you. Now, um, 1981 was quite a milestone, and in keeping with the theme that uh, 
the impact that Tampa Bay Downs uh, has had in terms of female accomplishment. In 1981, a 17-year-old girl named Julie Crone won a race as a jockey aboard a horse named Lord Farkle. Well, Lord Farkle would go on to win five more races that year. Julie Crone would go on to win 3,703 more races in her career. And Julie Crone was the first woman inducted into the National Racing Hall of Fame uh, as a jockey. Years later, she won the Belmont Stakes, she won a Breeders' Cup race. And she was not the first woman jockey, of course. The, uh, one of the first women jockeys was a woman named Diane Crump, C-R-U-M-P, who actually was from the area. And uh, women faced a lot of resistance in the late 60s, trying to become jockeys. Uh, at various tracks in South Florida and other places, uh, male jockeys would boycott the races rather than ride against women. And uh, eventually this was all settled in the course. And uh, now it is not unusual, uh, although there are too, uh, too many of them, but it's not unusual to see uh, a woman compete uh, on the racetrack. Now, when you talk about the handle and you talk about the money and you talk about how popular Tampa Bay Downs has become, uh, you have to go a little further along the timeline to 1989. Well, horse racing and money always go hand in hand and we all like to put our $2 bet in or our $200 bet in depending on how we're inclined and and take our chances. You know, you're betting against the other patrons at the track. That's why they call it paramutual wagering. Uh, that's why the odds shift and change during a race. And uh, uh, for some of you, you know, this may be common knowledge, but the favorite is always, the horse that has the lowest odds is always the horse that more money's been on. The horse that has the highest odds is always the horse with the least money bet on it. And over the course of the years, favored horses win roughly one-third of the races. Uh, may differ maybe 30% at some tracks, 37% at other tracks, whatever. But this, is, this statistic has held very firm over the years. The favorite's going to win one-third of the time. So if you're betting on a horse that's not the favorite, probability-wise, you have a, you know, a better than average chance of winning. Um, of course, that's not always true because every race is a different entity and you'll often hear the saying, well, when, I'm not even going to try to bet the favorite, uh, beat the favorite in this race because it looks too good and what have you. But that statistic has held firm. So anyway, all these tracks decide they want to generate more wagering and in 1989 simulcasting came along. Now, uh, simulcasting, for those of you who don't know, is the ability to wager on other tracks. The, the signal, the picture is beamed in by a satellite and all the technology is set up so that you can bet on every track that's being offered at Tampa Bay Downs or any place else. Intertrack wagering is also a name for this and this was introduced at Tampa Bay Downs in 1990. Tampa Bay Downs was the first track in Florida to accept a signal from another track. In this case it was Calder Racecourse and there was a big crowd that day even though we weren't racing because uh, it was in September and people came up because they wanted to bet on Calder and it wasn't long after that when we found out how popular it was that Tampa Bay Downs decided to go whole hog and accept signals from every track in the country. And uh, even now, you know, you can bet on the races in England, uh, which, you know, they're five hours ahead of time in the morning. But intertrack wagering came in full throttle. And I remember the first time uh, I took my father to the racetrack. And my father's been following the ponies since probably the late 40s. And I took him to the simulcast area at Tampa Bay Downs down in the clubhouse. And 
he sat down and he looked up at this wall of pictures from all these different tracks with the bright colors and every track uses a different scheme to try to attract people to their track and he's like this. His mouth open, you know. He's, he was like the perver proverbial kid in the candy store. <laughs> he, he could not believe that here he, here he was in a place where he could bet on anything going on. And the running joke, uh, we would we would go there every year for the Breeders' Cup, and I would get there. We'd get there about eleven, eleven thirty, and I'd order, order off the menu, and I'd order a nice lunch and food and dessert and everything. And my dad would look at me like this, and he say, "Are we here to eat or are we here to play the races?" <laughs> I'm going to eat first because I want to be able to eat before the races, just in case. But it was always a lot of fun. And a good day, at, a bad day at the races beats a good day anywhere else. I don't know if it's 100% accurate, but I've often heard it said. By the mid-90s, more than uh, 350 outlets across North America were taking Tampa Bay Downs signal. And more and more, the Tampa Bay Downs signal was gaining traction. But the next, uh, the next thing that was really going to make it popular came in 1997. I was working for the, uh, well, let me backtrack just a little. The year before that, I had a friend from the uh, Ocala area named Bernie, and Bernie and I argue about everything. I think that's why we're such good friends, <laughs> because uh, somehow, you know, we're just able to, you know, accept that we both have different opinions and move on. And I'd say, you know, Bernie, uh, this was in 1999, I said, my Rams are going to win the Super Bowl. They got the home field advantage. I'm all pumped up. They did win it, by the way. I'm all pumped up. And, and he says, home field advantage means nothing. I said, what do you mean home field advantage? They play an artificial turf. They got all this speed. It means nothing. Forget about it. And uh, I said to him in 1996, I said, Bernie, it looks to me, as we were up in the press box at Tampa Bay, like Tampa Bay Downs could fit a turf course inside the main dirt course. And Bernie said, no way. I said, well, look at it. There's plenty of room out there. They can just move a few things around and have a nice turf course and uh, grass, you know. And uh, never happened. So a few months later, Mrs. Thayer came up to the press box, and Bernie was sitting up there, and she looked at both of us and she said, what would you guys think about a turf course here at the track? And, uh, oh, do you, do you think you can do it, Mrs. Thayer? I said, yes, we're planning it. And then she left and I looked at Bernie and he said, oh, shut up. <laughs> <laughs> so, so in, in May, on May 14, 1997, the ground was broken for the turf course. Uh, I actually have the picture in my office there, um, you know, in my publicity office at the track, uh, of Mrs. Thayer, Mrs. King, and a couple other people, uh, you know, with the shovel and breaking ground. And uh, wouldn't you know it, less than a year later, May 2nd, 1999, uh, 1998 rather, the first turf race was held at Tampa Bay Downs. And that was actually on Kentucky Derby Day. And the crowd was an overflow crowd for Tampa Bay Downs, uh, 8,600 people. And the turf course has made such a huge difference in Tampa Bay Downs product because in thoroughbred racing, there are a lot of horses that are bred for the turf. It's just the way it is. Their, their parents and their grandparents were great turf horses. Uh, uh, maybe there's something a little, I don't know, get this technical myself, but maybe there's something a little different about their hooves that make them more adaptable and more suitable to running on the turf than the dirt. Um, the turf, in theory, should be a little less uh, demanding on the horses than the dirt track, uh, uh, although as an aside to that, Tampa Bay Downs is a very forgiving dirt track. But all of a sudden, all of these trainers who had primarily turf horses 
wanted to come and race at Tampa Bay Downs. And it's just continued that way for the last 20 years, which, by the way, that last 20 years has gone by quickly. And uh, it's nothing to have four or five turf races out of the 10 races we hold on the turf. Now, a couple other things that have really helped us are that uh, our management is not reluctant to say no turf racing today if the turf is a little too wet and they feel like it's going to be torn up. Uh, because, uh, you know, you don't want to lose three or four days for the sake of one day. And so, also, with our meet running from late November through early May, there's three or four months uh, where they can get that turf course back into good shape and uh, the growing season and whatnot. And when you go up there this year, you're just going to see a beautiful emerald green turf course that's just so spectacular to look at, and it's, it's just so much fun. Uh, the dirt course is really uh, uh, forgiving because it's, it's, uh, there's a large sand-based element to it. So it's, the horse has a little cushion to not sink into, but uh, there's some give to it. And this is another reason why trainers are very uh, appreciative and like to come down to Tampa Bay Downs is because it's, the, the, dirt course is very kind to their horses. And when horses have had a long year and maybe the trainer wants to keep them in training, but he wants to give them a little time off from competition, it's really a good place, a good track to get back into the swing of things and promote that, promote that, uh, getting back, uh, getting the horse enthused to get about racing. You know, it can be a very demanding sport. Um, the uh, progress continued to move along about five years after that, and in 2003, uh, Tampa Bay Downs really got into the swing of things by opening its Downs Golf Practice Facility. And you can go up to Tampa Bay Downs, uh, Brinter Golf Clubs, you can go out to the, uh, they have a, a full uh, uh, length driving range there. 270 yards. You can do all your practicing there. They have a nice short game area, putting green, etc. But also in the golf clubhouse is a betting window. So when you're done hitting the balls, you can go watch the races and make a bet right there from the comfort of the practice facility. Shortly after that, the Silks Poker Room opened. And that's on the third floor of the clubhouse, uh, third floor of the uh, uh, grandstand rather, and uh, also very popular with all kind of games, of uh, 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 poker tournaments, and we're trying to get uh, more going with that from the state because a portion of that money is allocated to thoroughbred purses. Our purses did go up uh, four times last year, and uh, it was a tremendous testament to uh, the popularity of the track. Uh, you know, we, like everyone else, uh, during the pandemic, we had a lot of issues. We were very fortunate. Uh, at the end of our meeting in 2020, the state of Florida let us stay open a little longer because a lot of these horsemen had no place to go. They were kind of stuck in place. So we continued to race uh, well into June. And um, a lot of them came back because of that, and, and it's just uh, just keeps moving forward, just keeps moving ahead. So uh, we do offer, uh, uh, as I mentioned, the Silk Spoke Room Golf Practice Facility of Thoroughbred Racing, and um, the racing product. We've had two horses come through Tampa Bay Downs to win the Kentucky Derby, and that's something we're really proud of. In 2007, uh, Street Sense won the Tampa Bay Derby and went on to win the Kentucky Derby. And in 2010, Super Saver, who finished third in the Tampa Bay Derby, went on to win the Kentucky Derby. Now the trick here, everybody, with Street Sense and Super Saver, is to look for a horse running in the Tampa Bay Derby that has the initials SS. And the next time that happens, you know, I, 
hopefully that will be the third time will be the term. You know, Street Sense was trained by a guy named Carl Nasker. And I don't know if you're familiar with him, but he had won the Kentucky Derby in 1990 with a horse named Unbridled. And that was the famous uh, derby where uh, ABC had had the foresight to put an isolated camera on Carl Nasker up in his box. Um, and his owner was a 90-year-old woman, or 88, 90 years old, uh, uh, named Mrs. Genter, Frances Genter. And she had been in racing forever, and she was wearing a uh, black and white uh, outfit, and she had kind of a pillbox type hat. And they had this isolated camera, and he's saying, he's moving up, you probably remember this, he's moving up, Mrs. Genter, he's taking the lead, Mrs. Genter. Oh, Mrs. Ginter, you're going to win the Kentucky Derby. I love you, Mrs. Ginter. <laughs> and we were watching this, and she's like, oh. And you're just praying that she doesn't have the big one right there. <laughs> it was the longest time between the derby in history, between the, the horse crossing the finish line and having the trophy presentation, because... They were going to, certainly going to wait on Mrs. Genter to get down to the winter circle to be there. And it was just, you know, it's still, if, if you remember it or if you saw it afterward, it, it just uh, still brings a catch to your throat. You know, it's just such an emotional moment. Anyway, just to backtrack a little, Carl Nasker at the beginning of the three-year-old season for Street Sense had told everybody that he was going to, Give Street Sense three races as a three year old. The, the horse had won the uh, Breeders' Cup Juvenile as a two year old, so he's already a top horse, looked like a top horse. But he said, I'm going to run him at Tampa Bay Downs and the Tampa Bay Derby. I'm going to run him in the Bluegrass. And I'm going to run him in the Kentucky Derby. And he actually finished second in the Bluegrass. But that, uh, that, the way he trained that horse up to the Kentucky Derby really meant a lot for Tampa Bay Downs because. Here was a trainer who had already won the Kentucky Derby saying, my first stop is going to be Tampa Bay Downs, and I'm going to win the Kentucky Derby with this horse. And sure enough, he did it. And, um, you know, we're still grateful to Carl. He's retired now, but he does get by the track occasionally. And so it's good to see him. He was a rodeo guy, you know, back in the day. Now he's a thoroughbred Hall of Famer. He's one of the nicest guys you're ever going to meet. Uh, you know, the uh, one thing I, I wanted to mention here, because as I mentioned, we did open 1926, and there were, there were a lot of years where uh, Tampa Bay Downs struggled financially, especially during the 30s, and we've had a really hard time accessing any kind of archives or old newspaper records. Well, we've been able to find out that for some years, Tampa Bay Downs only raced five or six days during the season, had to close down, but the business wasn't any good. In 1943, the uh, U.S. Army took over the track for a period of time um, and used it as a jungle warfare training center for troops getting ready to go to the Pacific. And so, uh, I guess, going back to what Red Smith said about... Uh, uh, a rude clearing in the palmetto thickets, you know, which he wrote four or five years later. I guess uh, that was the beginning. That's where it all started. And gradually, we have gotten to where we are now, and we're certainly hopeful that a lot of you are going to come out starting November 24th and see where we are now and see where we have the potential to go from here. So I want to thank you all for attending, and uh, certainly feel free to open up now for questions, and I'll try to help you out the best I can. Thank you. Thank you.